Hey, welcome to A Climate Conversation. This is our brand new podcast uh, that is uh, based because of this great movie that Walt Johnson, uh, actually, it was his vision, and uh, he stepped up, took money out of his retirement plan to have a conversation about the climate. I had the great honor to uh, narrate this particular film, and uh, we're excited to have these conversations about climate so that we're energy literate. Our first guest, we are thrilled, is Dr. Patrick Moore. You know him. He is the sensible environmentalist, and he's written a great book, Fake Invisible Catastrophes and Other Threats of Doom. Dr. Patrick Moore, it is great to have you as our first guest. Thanks very much, Kim. It's a pleasure and an honor. And uh, also my colleague, Dave O'Rourke, who is uh, with the whole group, A Climate Conversation. It's great to have you as well, Dave. It's wonderful to be here, Kim, and it's an honor to be with Walt and Dr. Moore. And Walt Johnson, you are the man of the hour. Did you ever guess that this little film would gain the notoriety and start to change the conversation the way it is, Walt? It's just awesome. That was the intent of it, for, to get everyone acquainted with what we're facing here and the costs and benefits of it. And we're doing that. Thank you. Thank you for your help, everyone. Well, definitely. So, Dave, I'm going to throw it over to you. Well, I have had the opportunity since we got involved in this project months ago, and really our, my particular role in this is the promotion and, and distribution and trying to make sure as many hearts and minds can become involved in this project as possible and kind of seize back the ground from the fringe so that the people who will be paying for this, for whatever solutions come up with, can be involved in the dynamics of the decision making, and they can do that from an informed standpoint. And so, again, to echo what you said, I, it's, it's hard to think of two people I'd rather have in the room when making decisions about the cost and benefit than, than the people that we are blessed to have today. But, Dr. Moore, I've been fascinated by your career. Uh, fascinated by the uh, some of the risks that you've taken, and I'm not talking about you know political risks or business risks, or but I'm talking about scary stuff with people shooting harpoons over your head uh, in the middle of an ocean from a small boat. I, I we're hoping to reach a large group of people here, people who really kind of don't, they're tired of the fringe and either either a denier or they're an alarmist and they're neither one of those things. They're American citizens or they're Canadian citizens and they would like to, or citizens of the world. And they kind of like to have somebody talk some sense to them and invert this idea of, of, away from propagandistic stuff and towards like, knowledge and information. You were in early on that game with Greenpeace and you've had a fascinating career since then. But, but as I, as I referred to, it started with some pretty brave actions. And if, if you don't mind for people who may not be as familiar with you as we are, take us through a little bit about that early career and uh, some of the risks that, uh, what looked like science, what looked like hippies, but were actually scientists were willing to take. Well, we, we weren't just scientists. There were lawyers, doctors, engineers, all professional people that looked like hippies because it was the hippie era. It was the late 60s, early 70s. And what we did was we followed the Quaker concept of bearing witness to the crime. And the crime that we started with was the five megaton hydrogen bomb tests in Alaska in the Aleutians by the United States Atomic Energy Commission, which at that time could be uh, seen as the most powerful organization in the world. And uh, 12 of us got on an old halibut boat and sailed across the North Pacific in some stormy seas. It was September going into November. And uh, I've never been that scared again in my life, uh, as we were coming across the Gulf of Alaska, uh, the seas were 30 feet high and we were in an 85 foot boat uh, with, with water coming in because the boards were moving. And so that's how it started. But amazingly, President Nixon, after we got on Walter Cronkite as a bunch of crazy Canadians going up uh, to, to challenge 
the most powerful organization in the world with atom with nuclear weapons. Uh, he canceled the remaining nuclear tests that were planned. So this was at the height of the Cold War, the height of the Vietnam War, and the emerging consciousness of the environment in the late 60s into the early 70s. And uh, we won uh, a, a tremendous victory. I mean, we were not, we were the spearhead. We weren't the whole movement because we, we ended up with tens of thousands of people marching in the streets in Canada. And the day the bomb was detonated, people gathered across the entire border of the United States and Canada at all the border crossings from both Canadian side and American side to hold hands in solidarity against these tests. And that caused an actual grassroots movement that ended up with the White House canceling any more nuclear tests. And so that was the beginning of the end of the escalation of nuclear weapons in the Cold War. And we were right there on the top of the heap. And it, it was quite an exhilarating experience. So we then went after the French atmospheric nuclear testing. All the other countries had gone underground some years prior. But France continued to test atomic and hydrogen bombs in the atmosphere at Mururoa Atoll in French Polynesia. Unbeknownst to the French public, every media in France was controlled by the government at that time. And so we were the ones who brought the message to Notre Dame Cathedral in a demonstration. Just eight of us went into the Notre Dame Cathedral with pamphlets, handing out the pamphlet about the boat that was going to Mururoa to stop the hydrogen and atomic tests. And uh, we, we thought we were going to take refuge in the church overnight. So when we announced that, the Surete guy said, sorry, this is not actually a church. It's a state monument now. And uh, so we got out, uh, but it, but the story was covered in Le Monde the next morning. A little piece about us being there and the t nuclear tests were mentioned. So we managed to spark an awareness and then we went to see the Pope in, in, uh, in Rome and were mentioned as being in the audience promoting peace. And then we went to the first Stockholm conference, the first UN conference on the environment in Stockholm, 1972. And uh, we didn't go to the alternative conference where everybody was dressed up like whales and, and, and birds and stuff. Uh, so it was kind of a celebratory hippie kind of thing, the counter conference. We went to the real conference where the delegates from all of the Pacific countries were, who were against these tests. And even though the superpowers, as they were called then, the nuclear weapons states, said, we're not talking about peace, war and peace here. We're talking just about the environment. And we said to the people in the room, Sur surely sending radiation all around the southern hemisphere in the atmosphere is something to do with the environment. And uh, they were overwhelmingly defeated by the conference. Uh, against French atmospheric nuclear testing. And that was the beginning of the end of that. Uh, they continued to do underground nuclear testing at Murrow into the 90s, uh, which is, uh, and, and before that, in 1985, when I was in New Zealand welcoming the Rainbow Warrior in, they bombed our boat and sank it in the harbor. And uh, that made a pretty good bunch of headlines. And that was the beginning you on the of the boat then? I was, I, no, I was a, an international director there to welcome the, the boat and crew while we had our little international meeting. So we, of course, you know, uh, coincided the two things. And so I was sleeping ashore when the phone rang at two minutes after midnight to say that the warrior had been bombed at the dock and was sunk on the bottom. Um, half the crew were still in the pub. The other half were still up on the boat. And... Uh, when the bomb went off, the captain looked below and saw it flooding. And then the cameraman went to the back where his bunk was to get all his 10,000 bucks worth of gear. And he went down and the second bomb went off, which was set onto the rudder assembly, propeller assembly to permanently disable the boat. So he couldn't just patch up a hole in the side of it. And uh, he died as a result. And we all think that those two bombs were meant to go off at the same time, but it was only about a two minute difference between them. 
when he ran back and went down below to get his gear. So they killed someone uh, in the process. And uh, I ended up being a spokesperson for with the police and, and authorities and the media in the aftermath of all that, which was pretty uh, amazing. Uh, we, we, we made news around the world and uh, not too many people were very sympathetic with the French after that. And yet the two people who were arrested, who didn't get out of New Zealand, there were about eight or 12 of them all together on the team. Uh, two people got caught at the airport and were sentenced to a lesser crime because uh, France said they'd stop buying uh, lamb uh, if uh, New Zealand didn't ease off a little bit. And so they ended up going to a French island for a year and then going home to a, a hero's welcome amongst their compatriots. But it, it uh, served its purpose. Uh, so that was kind of the beginnings of Greenpeace. And then we had pretty well done what we could. People said, well, why aren't you going after the Russians? Oh, great. We just love to go to, uh, <laughs> to our certain death. Uh, we've made enough of a point here, we think. And so uh, a, a whale scientist, psychologist, uh, came to us and said, you guys are the only ones who know how to go in boats and we have to go out and save the whales because they're killing 30,000 of them every year in the North Pacific, the Russians and the Japanese between the two of them. And uh, Bob Hunter and I, who were more or less in the leadership positions at that point, said, yay, yeah, let's, it's, it's one, you know, we, we, we've been after things that are death oriented ever since we started this, let's do something that's life oriented and balance it. Uh, and that's what the Save the Whales campaign did for us. It, uh, it, it made us famous. Uh, before that, there were a lot of people who were against us because we were only going after the Americans and the French, in other words, the West. And, uh, they're saying things like, well, why don't you go after the Russians? Oh, yeah, sure. Why don't you go after the Russians? <laughs> you first. And, yeah. And uh, so, but by getting onto the whale campaign, it was a beautiful campaign to have and to be in a boat going out and getting in front of the harpoons with the cameras rolling, coming back into San Francisco because we were off San Francisco where the Russians were. Where no one can see them because they were back then there was still only a 12 mile limit so they could kill whales right up to 12 miles offshore but no one ever no one ever saw they were ever there they came every year for years and years but you couldn't see them from the shore so it was pretty much top secret they were acting as spy ships too uh, of communications in the u.s so uh we did that and we got on to the, around the world that shot of the harpoon going over my friend's heads, I was driving the boat that the cameraman was in that took the shot of that harpoon going over their heads, Bob and George. And uh, it went around the world in like hour, in, in an hour, it was everywhere. We, we actually got back into San Francisco with the film footage, gave it to the media, went to a pub and watched ourselves on <laughs> TV. Uh, it was, that was pretty cool. And, and the whole thing was exhilarating all the time. I mean, we were raising money, we were making product, t-shirts and souvenirs. And, and there was a, a huge grassroots fundraising effort all through all this. And, and pretty soon we were getting more money than we needed. Uh, and pretty soon um, it became uh, so um, famous and lucrative and whatever you want to call it, that we started being infiltrated by people who wanted it for the money and for the political power. And so I, I describe it as being hijacked by the left. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm not against social socialism as a word um, because there's social things to be concerned about in this world. So I've always tried to maintain a, some kind of an even balance between um, practicality, if you want to put it better, a better word. And you mentioned sometimes the policy drives the science, and that's what's happening with climate change. Uh, 
it, there's there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that there is a climate catastrophe in this world. There's always been weather, and there's always been foul and miserable weather. And the amount of people who are dying from weather now are only 10% of 100 years ago in terms of the per capita. Because we have much more resilient structures, uh, and in particular, we have early warning. When, when hurricanes came in 1800, there was no warning. There weren't any weathermen or meteorologists to tell people that the thing was coming. And so, you know, tens of thousands of people would be killed in, in these huge storms. Whereas now everybody gets in their car and goes inland. And uh, that's just one example. And when it comes to any form of weather-related incidents, uh, the, 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 the number of people that are harmed or killed by it is so much less than it was before. And, and then you look at the poorer countries, like Philippines was in a hurricane that killed, God, I forget it was 10,000 people or something. That hurricane would hardly have killed anybody in Canada or the United States because we have the technology. Um, one of my favorite uh, uh, parables about that is in the Japanese tsunami earthquake, no one died from the earthquake. They know how to build buildings that do not fall down in an earthquake. 20, nearly 20,000 people died from the tsunami washing whole towns into the sea. And then they have the nerve to call it the Pacific garbage patch in a photograph on the internet because all this stuff was washed into the sea, but it wasn't because people were throwing plastic into the rivers. And so, uh, and, and I was the only person that found that picture and exposed it in my book as being a fake. It said underneath part of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which actually doesn't exist. And we could go on and talk about that at some point too, because people think it really exists when it doesn't. All the images of it are paintings. That there's not a single image of the actual Pacific Ocean from space with a big patch of garbage in the middle of it, because it isn't there. There's discarded fishing gear is the worst uh, that there is. That's the main thing that is in the ocean, but it's spread all over the place. It's not like all in one big lump somewhere. And, and, and they should do something about that. But the problem is fishermen, or fishers as you're supposed to call them now, uh, fishers only have so much room on their boat. And when they have a huge net that's torn and no longer useful, they don't want to store it on their boat because they want to store the fish and the ice on the boat and the people because they're cramped. And I've been on a number of fishing boats in my life and I'm glad I didn't become a fisherman. But my young youngest son has spent three years tuna fishing in the Pacific offshore and uh, I'm proud of him for having done that. Uh, I, I think that I should introduce my, my concept uh, in, in my latest book, Fake Invisible Catastrophes and Threats of Doom. Um, I call it the universal theory of scare stories. And it's, it's introduced early in the book as to what this universal theory is, is that all the scare stories somebody name me one that doesn't fit in the, these two categories, are either invisible, like radiation, carbon dioxide, and whatever the bad thing in GMOs is supposed to be, which doesn't have a name. Everything has a name, so that means it doesn't exist. It's just a fake thing that, that's invisible. Then there is remote. Polar bears and coral reefs are the icons for a reason. It's because no one can see them for themselves or hardly anybody. The number of people that go diving and, and snorkeling are less than 1% of the population, probably less than a tenth of a percent. And the number of people that can go to the Arctic and go all the way around and count all the polar bears are a handful of scientists, many of whom are promoting the polar bear extinction hoax. Even though the polar bear has grown in numbers tremendously no one knows why. A treaty was signed among all polar nations in 1973, banning the unrestricted hunting of polar bears, which had been the case previously. 
And now rich guys could go up there and get an airplane and hire an Inuit guide and go and kill a bunch of polar bears for their rug on the, on the floor or on the wall. And uh, so the polar bear population was declining due to overhunting, not because of climate change. And when that came into effect, many of the polar countries, like Norway, for example, just banned polar bear killing altogether. Canada allows the Inuit people, because we have the most Inuit people, uh, along with Russia. And but ours are further north. We, we, you know, Russia's land doesn't go anywhere near as far into the Arctic as Canada's land does. That's why Canada is the coldest country in the world because it has more land in the north than Russia does. And uh, hardly anybody knows that. Most people think Ru Russia does have the coldest temperatures in the world in its center. But overall, the average, Canada is colder. And, and the Canadian government's calling it an, a climate emergency, even though we're the coldest country in the world. And not only that, um, well, fake invisible catastrophes and threats of doom. I think I've explained what I mean by that. Name me a scare story that isn't based on something that's either invisible, non-existent, or so remote that the average person can't see it. Because the polar bear population has grown from between six and 8,000 to between 30 and 50,000 since Pat 1973. So Patrick, I think that we've all been at oh, a party or we might be at a dinner, uh, might be a young person that talks about the big garbage heap in the ocean or talks about the polar bears or the coral reef. And I've done enough interviews with you that I know enough just to be dangerous, but how would you recommend that people respond? to those conversations? Well, they should read my book and there's a number of other <laughs> books too. Uh, I knew you'd say that. <laughs> yeah, but there, there, there really are quite a, a, right. a goodly number of books now which expose the climate crisis for the fakery that it is. And it it is a made up story. Now, it, it's so upside down, it's hard to, for people to believe that we are living today in one of the earth's coldest periods. It's called the Pleistocene Ice Age. We are in an interglacial period, one of about 40 that have occurred since the Pleistocene set in 2.6 million years ago. So that there's now huge caps of ice on both poles, which did not exist for the previous 250 million years. The Karoo Ice Age was the one before this one. It lasted from 350 to 250 million years ago. In other words, it was 100 million years long where the earth was cold like it is now. That's why all that ice is on the poles. And they always show you the minimal extent of Arctic ice in the middle of the summer after six months of 24-7 sunshine. They don't show you the winter when there isn't a square inch of the Arctic Ocean that isn't covered in ice and overflowing over the Arctic Circle into the Bering Sea, into Hudson Bay, way down into Hudson's Bay is fully covered in ice. So it's not as if the ice is disappearing. They, they keep saying it is, uh, but they cannot demonstrate that it's disappearing. It, it isn't. And not only that, we are towards the end of this interglacial period based on many previous ones that we know about the pattern. It's, it's, it's the Vostok ice cores go back 800,000 years. So we have seen eight on a 100,000 year cycle. We've seen eight of these glacial periods, which are called glacial maximums, where the whole of Canada was covered in ice and nearly the whole of Russia was covered in ice. And the Antarctic ice was much more extensive than it is today. Now we're in this interglacial period that began about 10,000 years ago at a temperature similar to what we're at now, only it was warmer then. It was called the Eocene Thermal Maximum, Holocene, sorry, the Holocene Thermal Maximum, because it was warmer during the first part of this interglacial. We are now, by all records of historical pattern, are gradually descending now into the 85,000 year descent into the next glacial maximum, just like it's happened already 40 times plus. Wow. So that that's so we're in the coldest period that the earth has seen in tens of millions of years. In 
the, the, the Eocene thermal maximum occurred 50 million years ago, and the temperature of the Earth has gone steadily downward, then leveled out, then downward, then level out, then downward, and it's now it's downward, we're at, at the bottom. It's the coldest it's been for over 200 million years. So is it, is it also true that CO2 levels are lower now than they've been historically? I mean, over billions, hundreds of billions of years, are we not at, we're at a low temperature, but are we not also at a low CO2 level? You guessed just exactly what I was going to say next, because that is the other point. There's these two points. We are in one of the coldest periods of the Earth's history now. It's an ice age called the Pleistocene. The International Agency, the Committee on Stratigraphy, the International Committee on Stratigraphy, which are the layers of sediment in the ground where you can read the history of the Earth, they have declared the Pleistocene to be over because they now say the Pleistocene is an epoch, E-P-O-C-H. Now they've said the Holocene interglacial period is an epoch, even though it's exactly the same as the previous 40, which were not, are not called epochs, they're called interglacial periods. So they have artificially ended the Pleistocene ice age, even though it is still in effect. They've just renamed the interglacial period an epoch. Therefore, the previous epoch is over. That's what they've done. And they won't, it's not in their minutes anywhere. It's not in any of their literature, how they did this, when they did it, why they did it. There's no explanation for it. And you, when you write the head guy, you get nothing back. So they're in cahoots with all the rest of the scientists who are, are, are pseudoscientists in many cases who are receiving most of their money from the government. So it's politicians ordering bureaucrats to give money to researchers, mainly in the universities, where if they don't toe the line, they're gone. And that's all there is to it. And everybody knows that, who knows anything about this situation. So the truth is about CO2, that it fell to the lowest level in the history of the earth only 20,000 years ago at the peak of the most recent glacial maximum. When the oceans cool, as they do in a, in a glacial maximum, they absorb CO2 from the atmosphere and the other gases too, oxygen and hydrogen and everything else that's in the atmosphere gets absorbed into the ocean to a certain extent. But it, it's, it, it's interesting that the colder a liquid is, the more gas it can hold. Whereas the atmosphere holds more gas when it's warmer. Uh, interesting but I don't even know how to describe why that is but it's true that when the oceans warm then coming out of the glacial maximum into the interglacial period they give off CO2 which had dropped to 180 parts per million during the most recent glacial maximum that is only 30 parts per million above the death of plants it is actually surmised that at high altitudes the plants did die because the higher you go, the thinner the air is, including the CO2. So there wouldn't have been enough CO2 at, say, two, 3,000 meters uh, to support plant life. And there's evidence of that in the, in, in, in the record. So it, it's just, it, it's theoretical, but it's thought that that must have happened because it came so low, even at sea level, it came down to 180 ppm. Then as the ocean warmed, it came up to 260, then 280, and that's where we came in at 280, and now it's 420. And finally, it is getting to a level that is not yet optimum for plants, but that is at least 20 to 30% better than it was when, when we came out of the uh, most recent interglacial inter period. So that, that, that is the truth, that, that CO2 was 6,000 parts per million when forests evolved. And it's perhaps one of the reasons why they were so lush and the earth was so warm at that time. And then the Karoo Ice Age came uh, and lasted 100 million years. And so everything got pushed towards the equator. 
One of the most important points about this whole thing with people declaring climate emergencies that live in cold countries is that we are actually a tropical species. We came out of Africa at the equator. That's where we evolved. And we haven't changed that much since, except we've turned white when we're up where the snow is. And, uh, you know, various, various things and that anatomically have changed, but basically our insides are still the same thing they were when we were born in Africa. And that was for hundreds of thousands, millions of years of evolution at the equator. If it were not for fire, shelter, and clothing, we could not have come out of Africa. We would all die. I'm sure all of you and me are in places where if we didn't have fire, shelter, and clothing, we would not survive the early winter because we can't, we just can't. Our bodies are 36 C inside. And when you go down to zero and you don't have any clothes on and you're in the shade, a human dies at actually at 18 to 20 degrees Celsius. Sorry, I'm Canadian, so I speak in these terms, but, uh, a human being dies at room temperature, naked in the shade, 20 degrees. We usually think of room temperature being more like 22. And that you could survive that for a time. But uh, the truth of the matter is, we are a tropical species. And we should not be upset about uh, it's being too hot in Canada, or Sweden, or Russia. Canada is the coldest country in the world, just a little bit colder than the average of Russia. Russia is the second coldest. Then you got Sweden and Norway and those countries that are also very cold. Sweden has made one of the smartest moves of any country in the world in the face of this ridiculous wind and solar net zero fantasy. And I mean fantasy. There's no possibility that that could work. It's been calculated that you'd need enough batteries for two times the global GDP would cost to get enough batteries to back up wind and solar on a, on a global basis. So it's dead in the water. Not only that, fossil fuel use rose this year. Again, like it has been for 50 years. It didn't even start to go down. And it's not going to either. It's just a total fantasy. And it's, it's a fantasy that's costing trillions of dollars. It's a good thing we've got a lot of money, but it's not good for the people who don't. And there's lots of those. And so we're, we're in a real mess here right now. What with, well, but at least we can see a little bit of turnaround in Argentina, in, in, in Holland, uh, where people with some sense in their head are gaining uh, favor from the public in 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 voting, and so, th this is a good this is a good sign. So I'm fascinated. I'd love to hear from from Walt too. I, this fascinates me. Is that so? The fan of detective novels and literature and this Latin term cui bono, right? Who benefits? You look look for the motivation to see who committed the crime. What is the motivation to spend this money to go to net zero? What What's driving? Well, who wins if we make humans the enemy, the the ultimate enemy, the only enemy, the only the most dangerous game, the the end of the earth? If we do that, who benefits from this? What is causing this? Causing scientists to say untruthful things that they know, causing people to publish information in a distorted way to doctor photographs of garbage heaps to come up with miracles of invisibility and remoteness that can't be disproved or won't be who benefits from that what is what is the industry that's driving this i'd love to hear walt do you any thoughts you have dr moore what, what i'll start it out uh I just talk to rocks. I can't get inside people's <laughs> minds and read them. Uh, but anyway, uh, I have a lot of suspicions about it. And, and it isn't the average person that's going to benefit from all of this. And, and we, we seem to be in a Malthusian type of economic mentality to think that 
the earth can only support so many people. And if we follow all the things that they've proposed so far and get rid of fertilizer, for instance, our, our world can only support about uh, 3 million people, 3 billion people, excuse me. And, and, and most people will have to eat, and, the, and then they'll be eating bugs and grain. And that doesn't sound good to me. And, and I, I, I have a feeling there's a global mentality to control people personally. Well, it sounds, like, it, it sounds a bit like when there was an effort to get rid of, to ban chlorine uh, back in the Greenpeace days, if I'm not mistaken. Was there not an effort to ban global use of chlorine once upon a time? Is, that, that, is fertilizer banning the new chlorine ban? Yep. I, the reason I left Greenpeace, finally, the last straw was ban chlorine worldwide. Uh, was adopted as a slogan by my fellow directors and as much as i tried i could not convince them that that was pretty stupid because sodium chloride is an essential nutrient for all animals life and uh so there's there's for starters uh you can't live without chlorine and uh, then there is the fact that adding chlorine to drinking water and swimming pools and spas was the biggest advance in the history of public health by stopping waterborne communicable diseases like cholera. And then there is the fact that chlorine is one of the most important elements in the periodic table. Yes, it can be used in war as a weapon, but so can lead. And we don't ban lead because it has also a lot of good uses besides making bullets to kill people with. And so I had to leave because I realized we had been hijacked by people who were only interested in sensationalism and money and that they were going, they were willing to lie uh, and, and cover up the absolute beneficial uses of chlorine. It, it, nearly 80% of our medications are made with chlorine chemistry and 25% of them actually have chlorine in them. So these are our, our, our the medicines we take to cure ourselves, along with table salt, which is something that if you, you know, the reason Gandhi made salt at the sea was because the British were putting a huge tax on salt and it's essential even for the poorest people. So that was why Gandhi went to the sea and made salt. And uh, I, I personally think that was his most noble um, demonstration or uh, action. Because it, 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 uh, it saved a lot of people's lives and uh, it made the point very sharply. In, in Walt's new movie, which is a wonderful thing, I remember the first time I saw it, I've seen it many times since, there's a there's a fundamental question that's asked, which is, and you, you referenced it a bit ago, this fundamental question about sort of the morality of net zero and battery production. So two times GDP, global GDP is a lot of money. And that's a lot of opportunity cost. That money is buying useful things around the world, like food, clothing, shelter, transportation, education, communication, computing powers, do, doing a lot. So that has to be replaced by something. But at the same time, is there enough raw material and is it accessible enough to build enough battery storage power and what's the human cost of recovering it if we could? Well, that's in your movie to some extent. Uh, uh, there's a good section of the movie about that. Yes, there is. And, and I've been talking to Lord Mockton, who's done a lot of work on the, the ability to get the materials to build this. And basically, some of these materials, in order to mine them, to have everybody in the world on this Green New Deal and, and and going all electric, it would take 2,000 years to mine enough material to do that. Now, these devices last about 20 years. So uh, you, you get into the, the nitty gritty and it, it doesn't make any sense at all. 
what we're doing. And, and the cost, and, and like Ken Gregory did the calculating on the cost, and he said, well, it will cost uh, $1.1 million, $1 million for every adult in the United States. But only half of the people, only half of the adults in the United States pay income tax. So for all of us, that means each of us have to pay $2.2 million. And, and, and I mean, that takes it takes a real hit on your retirement account you know? <laughs> more than making a movie. That's what motivated me. <laughs> but uh, you know, it, 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 you get into the details and that's why we need to have a lot of conversations on exactly how we're going to do these things. If people are proposing them. So yeah, I don't know if you know of the Manhattan contrarian, Walt Francis Menton. Yes, I, I know of them. I I, not, I don't follow them well. There are just so many hours in a day, and and again, I spend most of my day talking to rocks. So, well, he I, he writes nice, concise pieces, um, but he has demonstrated categorically that it's simply impossible to make enough batteries to back up a global wind and solar uh, technology system. He he calculates that it would take two times the global GDP to make enough batteries, if you could mine enough stuff. And that's the other thing is, is the amount of environmental damage and how, and what are they going to use to power the mining machines? Uh, and, and the, and so far it's fossil fuels. Exactly. And it, it's, it's, I have said from the beginning that all the, all the windmills and all the solar panels, should have to be made with energy that's generated by wind and solar and see how much you got left over. Right. And that, that would be a really good experiment. I, I, I don't know if anybody's done that math or not, uh, but the, the truth of the matter is, is that the battery storage will cost more than the wind and solar by at least 10 times. So you've already got wind and solar. They're claiming they're cheaper than fossil fuels, but they are lying about that. And, and they only work half the time. If you're, if you're lucky, it's more like a third. And so there's no possibility that we could have a battery system that would, for example, work for two weeks for the whole world. It's not going to happen. And yet that is the transition that they are aiming for, uh, apparently. And a lot of people are going to get run over by the bus uh, as this thing becomes seen for the hoax that it is, I hope. Because the, the, the people who are, who are defending it are, are making scads of money off it at this point. And, uh, but now I see the, the offshore wind going broke. Um, and the, the, the writing's on the wall, as far as I can see. It's just a matter of time now until we give up on this uh, concept. So I, I, I'm fascinated by this. And I, you know, think of me as a, not a scientist, a businessman, uh, American citizen. Just try to be a thoughtful person. And I, and I try to put it together and understand the nuclear option, which is a term that's used in... <laughs> you know, everything from divorce to football games uh, appears to be a thing that is cheaper, faster, cleaner, safer, proven, available, and in place and all, and has demonstrated a track record in terms of propulsion under the water for billions of miles without a death. And, and, and Dr. Marnie, you've done a lot of work, and I believe this is in your book. Can you help me understand why unavailable, unaffordable, unattractive, uneconomic things like battery storage, that zero, one, and zero are a mantra of goodness and something that's provably beneficial is poisoned by the same people? How 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 do they thread that needle? How is this how is this argument actually made? And how's it appears to have been made effectively? It's made because it's invisible. 
And that's all there is to it is radiation is invisible and they've got us all scared about it when in fact the sun's rays are radiation and you don't want to lay in the sunlight for eight hours at a stretch or you will get badly burned by radiation. Uh, but the sun is uh, somewhat essential to the existence of ourselves on this planet. So you have to kind of take that into account too. And when it comes to the, the more than 100 operating nuclear plants in Canada and the United States, between the two of us, not one person has been killed by nuclear energy in a, there's been a couple of deaths have happened in, in science facilities where they're doing something new or etc. But no, no one has been e even injured by radiation in the nuclear plants. How many people are being injured in the fossil fuel sector? Lots of them. And in the mining of coal. So we take that, uh, well, I know they want to end coal, uh, but uh, apparently you can make liquid fuel out of coal because the South Africans have been doing it for a long time. And uh, so there's all kinds of possibilities for continuing to use fossil fuels. But the truth of the matter is we could replace at least 50% of the fossil fuels with nuclear in a few decades if we took a crash course in doing so. Hydroelectric is great too, but it's only available where they, you have the combination of rainfall and topography. And Denmark doesn't work for that and neither does Saudi Arabia. So uh, th there's where nuclear makes sense. And it actually makes so much more sense than anything else for anything that is stationary and requires electricity or heat. In other words, about 30% of all our energy is used in buildings for heating, cooling, uh, hot water, uh, etc. Lighting, all of that could be supplied by nuclear. 100% of it. Things that move are the hardest to adapt to nuclear energy because you're not going to put a nuclear reactor in a car. So uh, if, if battery-driven cars ever do get to where they are as reliable and, and, and uh, convenient as uh, internal combustion engine cars, uh, it would make sense to use nuclear energy to ch charge the batteries. And that would also reduce uh, the amount of fossil fuel. On the other hand, uh, I'm not someone who just wants to completely warp markets and shred them up. Uh, if fossil fuels are the most uh, cost-effective fuel for doing a certain thing, we shouldn't ban them as long as they're using good pollution control and and all through the, the, their chain uh, are doing the right thing. Uh, the CO2 that goes into the atmosphere is entirely beneficial. Uh, there is nothing negative about it whatsoever. And the, the, thing, the whole thing about methane is a, it, it's, uh, it doesn't even count. So, what, but CO2 does count in that it is the most important molecule for life and along with water the two of those make sugar which is the energy for all life and photosynthesis is the pathway to putting those two things together and making sugar it's as simple as that and right now we have a a, a very low level of co2 in our atmosphere compared to what life grew up with over hundreds of millions of years and Everybody should know that all commercial greenhouse growers buy CO2 or make it themselves by burning natural gas, which they have to buy, in order to get 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 percent increase in growth in what they're growing in their greenhouse. Double the CO2, triple the CO2, and you get huge increases in growth because that's the what the, those plants grew up with. Most people don't know about C3 and C4 plants. For a long time, there were only C3 plants. And as the CO2 level declined in the global atmosphere, many of those C3 plants were basically 
in starvation mode. They could still live, but they were stunted because the CO2 was so low. And suddenly, through evolution, some plants turned into C4 plants, which is a different way of using the CO2, storing it in the daytime and using it at night. And there's a number of factors around it that makes it way more efficient. And corn is one of the C4 plants. And this year, there is the biggest crop of corn in the history of the world, largely because of the increased CO2 in the atmosphere. Wow. And the same is true of virtually all the other plants, especially those grown in greenhouses. But even the ones that are being grown in open air are now getting 420 ppm instead of 300 and some. So it's, it's a huge benefit to, the, to all of life on Earth. And these people who think there's too many people, why are they still here? If they actually believe that. <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't they be the ones that should come forward and fall on their swords? Right? It's only logical. If they think there's too many people, then they could really help a lot. <laughs> I don't think there's too many people. Um, I think there's too many poor people. And and what we're doing right now in this world is making sure there's still lots of them. Right. Right. You know, and that's a sh that's a crying shame. Uh, the, 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 but the truth is, politics is one of the most imperfect things there is, no matter what side you're on. It's never going to be perfect. It, science can be pretty close to perfect, and then everybody ignores it. You know, especially the fact that CO2 is lower now than it has been in almost the entire history of the Earth, and it's colder now than it has been during almost the entire history of the Earth. That's those are two facts that say it all. And, th and there's many more that go along with that. But those two facts, you'd think that it would be recognized because it is true. I, I like I've had experience on the nuclear side several decades ago. I came up with a very inexpensive way to, with geophysics, determine the elastic moduli of the near surface of the soil. And no one could see any value of that, so they, they permitted me to give it in a, as a paper. And I went out to give it in a paper in, uh, I think it was in Oregon, maybe. And, and as I'm talking and getting questions, it became apparent people in the audience had read the abstract, had gone out already and tried my technique. And it was the nuclear industry that was using it for siting nuclear plants. And I thought, wow, here's my chance to get rich. And I, I was really excited. But then about three months later, Three Mile Island happened. And, yep. and that's been a, a four-letter word in, uh, in in the United States ever since. And, and yes, as, as, uh, as Dr. Moore has been saying, we, we've killed a lot more people, even building, falling off of these windmills <laughs> than we killed in nuclear plants. Well, nobody, so, nobody has been killed in them. Not even a bandage has been required. Nothing to do with radiation anyways. But, but we have this invisible scare, as you, you said. And, and, yep. and, and really, I think we should be looking at that more. We'll have to eventually. Uh, but probably sooner than better. And let economics drive what, what works best, I think. You, you know, I've just mentioned that we have a lot of visible signs of the impact of these things where I live in California, Dr. Moore, I remember I was going to school at Berkeley when some of the Greenpeace activities and the Save the Whale thing, I used to have a Save the Whale necklace that I, I wore for a number of years in my misspent youth. <laughs> but we have many a signs here in California of the impact, the cost side of this climate conversation that are here now, $6 gas last month, diesel fuel was up almost seven, almost $7. And now California's passed some new legislation again. There was a couple of wonderful pieces of legislation that were recently passed here in California. One is to reduce the amount of water per human per day from 47 gallons to 42. 
after the largest single year of waterfall runoff ever measured in California, 90% of which went into the ocean through the Delta and was not saved and was not put into watersheds, was not used for hydroelectric. In fact, four hydroelectric dams along the Klamath River have been taken down at the cost of a billion dollars recently, which seems to me like what a, the Luddite party would do if we were able to have a Luddite party come in and compete. We're seeing the costs of these decisions, these policies in a very real way, in an impactful way. Walt's film and your work, your book, your career, what we're doing with this podcast is an effort to try to put rationality back into this. So people can watch the movie, they can read the book. What else can people do? Can the popular, how can the Vox, how can the popular Vox, what, what can we do to make a difference and turn this thing back in the air, back into a rational direction? Yeah, I'd, love to, I'd love to hear, you must have some ideas about this. <laughs> what can we do? How do we fight back? What do you say, Walt? Uh, I, doing the things we're doing is, is we just have to make people more aware and, and try to cause people to think. Uh, we, we've deliberately tried to not make this a political thing, but just a human thing that we have to get into. And and I think I think that's what motivated motivated me to go this way and, and try this to get a bigger audience. Now. Uh, Craig Wrightstone wrote that wonderful book, uh, Inconvenient Facts. A mm -hmm. And it was so, I was so impressed with it, I went and bought a whole stack of these books to give them out to people. A and, and then I went around a year later and, and no one had read it to speak of. Just very few people did. And so I thought this would be something maybe we could get more information to more people more quickly in, in a rational manner without polarizing people before we we start to talk and we need to do a lot of talking if we're going to in our society which we don't that's my take yeah well speaking of a lot of talking i can tell you i've done an awful lot of talking and it i i i hate to say that it falls on deaf ears a lot of the time um there there doesn't seem to be any motivation to celebrate our existence these days and why shouldn't we i mean it's a miracle that we're here and i mean I'm, I'm not a particularly religious person i just know that it's a miracle i know that actually we don't know of anywhere else in the universe where there is any life at all not even a worm right never mind a sentient human being and so just just that one point that we are so lucky so fortunate to exist that we should celebrate that and not get hung up on all this doom and gloom uh, about climate catastrophes you know i mean yeah it's going to rain and it's going to blow and there's going to be earthquakes and lightning and thunder it's going to happen but we're pretty good in in, in our in, in, in the developed world at protecting ourselves from all those things. And I'm still alive at 76 and hoping for a few more years. Uh, but I will never uh, look back with a negative uh, opinion about things, no matter how stupid people are. You know, and there's a lot of stupid going on right now. Uh, they call it the Inflation Reduction Act when all it did was cause inflation. Right. You know, I mean, how can, how, why, why don't people go marching in the streets about that in, instead of condemning Israel? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm flabbergasted at what's going on in the world. So I just try to stick to my own track and, uh, and talk about what I know about. Uh, I watch the politics in the world with amazement that 
it can be so backwards and twisted, but it is. And the, the, but this whole issue of energy and climate, um, the climate actually doesn't cost that much. It's a bunch of research in universities and stuff. It's the energy side of it that is going to kill us because that's where the real money is. And there are two sides of the same coin, the climate crisis and the energy transition. And the energy transmission is what will bankrupt the Western world if they don't get off this track. Right. That's definitely right in the cards. They haven't even they haven't even made a dent yet. As a matter of fact, the fossil fuel increase last year, this year. It, it, it hasn't started to go down yet. And they can build all the windmills and solar panels they want, and it still won't go down. It has to be replaced with something that is reliable, and that means 24-7. It doesn't mean intermittent a third of the time. So simple as that. And, and hopefully we will wake up sooner than later, but I'm afraid the powers that be are benefiting from you know the scandals that have, are going on in the U.S. at the highest level. Uh, what do you do about it? Doesn't seem anybody's doing anything about it. Quite a lot of talk, but not a lot of action. Well, well, this is an effort. Our podcast, Walt's wonderful film, your career, is testimony that there are people who um, love life. Yes. Love humanity and love their children. And they're as, as bunch, as big a bunch of sinners as their fellow man are now and will always be love humanity and kind of, and can see the crazy. I think we need to, and it's a shame that you have to, that the crazy has to be the focus of so much of the work, but it's, that's what it is in order to get to the good stuff. I think we're probably going to have to fight our way through. And in that regard, I hope people will visit. Uh, it's been a Chiron that's been running along the bottom of climateconversation.com. I hope that they will get and read not only your, Current, not only the book we've been talking about, um, the fake invisible catastrophes and threats of doom, but Confessions of a Greenpeace Dropout, which is a wonderful piece of work from, I think, 2011, something in that range. It was updated in 2013 uh, because a bunch of stuff happened then. I mean, my, my book came out less than two years ago when net zero had not even been coined yet. Wow. So I have to write a new book. Right you away. Write, there's, a, there's, a, there's an uptick for you here. There's an there, there, there was no such concept in January of night of 2020. Is wow. They, no, they're so much better at marketing. The, this other side is so much yes. better at marketing than than people who want to go about their lives, who aren't you know don't spend their lives in trying to be involved in you know radical change for its own sake or for their own sake. But you you have been a wonderful conversationalist. That's what this podcast is about, creating a conversation among good people, like-minded people who, who want to seek solutions that can be implemented, that make sense, that, that treat humanity as, as a precious thing uh, a rare in this universe and precious and wonderful thing that you, I, it's a mystery to me how you can look in the eyes of your child and or your grandchild if you're as old as i am which most of us here not not young kim <laughs> right but most of us are you can look you're in getting their, into trouble there dave o'rourke so <laughs> <laughs> you can look in their faces and not want more earth how you can not want more perfect planet. Uh, so it's, it's been, Kim, I, I know this is your your program and I'm sorry I, I'm talking so much, but I, I it's been an honor for me to be part of this today and I'm, I'm thrilled. 
to have gotten to, to get to know Dr. Moore a little bit and always to visit with Walt. Well, absolutely. And Walt, again, the man of the hour to have this vision as a guy who talks to rocks to have this film, which is making a difference. Congratulations. Thank you to all of you in, in helping to get this type of message out to everybody. Uh, thank you, Dr. Moore, for participating in this. We This has been a, a real good conversation, and it fits in with our movie in that we're having conversations. Thank you. Well, thank and you Patrick all Moore, for what you've done. Yeah, Patrick Moore, yeah, you and I have had a number of conversations. You're a great guest on the show, great guest here on our inaugural a Climate Conversation podcast. Thank you for all the work that you do and just you're continually caring about humankind. Thank you. Well, I sure hope I can get back on with you again one of these times and talk about a bunch of other stuff. There's so many wonderful topics. Uh, that's what I tried to do in my book. It covers quite a few uh, issues that I haven't even mentioned today. Um, and uh, I think if, if people read it from cover to cover, they will just see how true it is that it's fake, invisible, and remote, and they're having the wool pulled over their eyes if they believe any of this stuff. Yes, One in that more. book, Fake, Invisible Catastrophes and Threats of Doom. And uh, so, Patrick, I'll have my people call your people, which means I'll send you an email, okay? <laughs> very good. Thank you very much, Kim, for having us on. Absolutely. Thanks to all of you. Cheers. If you enjoyed the podcast, please consider going to Amazon and purchasing one of Dr. Moore's books or finding other interviews with him that we think you'll find of great interest on YouTube. There are many, many interviews with Dr. Moore, but please visit aclimateconversation.com where you can find more information about the film you can purchase a DVD Blu-ray and you can contribute to future projects. We hope you'll consider doing that and we hope we'll see you at our next podcast. Thanks for joining us. Okay, that'll do it.